Good evening. My name is Myra Olenek, and I'm the director here at Peters Township Public Library. And first of all, I'd like to say Happy Valentine's Day. And we love the fact that you're here with us. So thank you so much. I hope you found your Hershey Kisses on your seat. I also hope you noticed that what is also there on your seat is a list of our complete new resources, which are a phenomenal gift any day of the year. Uh, one thing you will need to open any of those resources, though, is our wagon card. And this is the library card that opens you up to over a million items of books and CDs and DVDs, books on audio, and we share the, this card with 19 other different libraries in the region. So if you're not in a hurry on your way out, I really encourage you to step, step up to our uh, front desk here and we'd be happy to get you a library card. A few other programs that I want to tell you before I tell you about tonight is coming up in March, we have a family meal planning 101 which will be on March the 26th. You can find all of this on our website, ptlibrary.org, which is also on your e-resources handout. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity. We have a registered and licensed dietitian who's going to help with meal planning. Families are so busy these days, so it's a, it's a nice opportunity to learn a little bit more about that. Also, speaking of health literacy, in March, we are having our public library blood drive. And it will be around uh, St. Patrick's Day, so it will be on Friday, the March, March the 15th. And all participating donors will receive a St. Patrick's Day t-shirt while the supplies last. So we have these. This information is also on our website, but we have flyers at the front desk and over near our new books. One other upcoming event that is happening this month on a Sunday, uh, Sunday, February 24th, we are hosting what we call a book club for book clubs. Over near our elevator, maybe some of you came in that way, we have over 25 local area book clubs that our uh, Peters Township Library Foundation has fostered. We have their lists. We order what they're reading. We get it both digitally and also hard copies. And so this event is to serve almost as a precursor to our big author visit coming in November when we're going to bring in a Quinlan here. So we're going to be discussing uh, her, one of her recent books, Lots of Candles, Plenty of Cake, we're also going to share information that you might want to share with your book clubs. If you're not a book club, that's not a problem. If you're a reader, we'll have something there for you, including cake pops. So those are a couple of other upcoming events here at the library. As far as tonight's program, first of all, I wanted to start by thanking our local Memorial Park Post 764, which is our VFW post, which is their neighbors of ours right through the intersection down below. And I wanted to thank their commander, Gary MacArthur, and quartermaster, Michael Clower, for their uh, close partnership with us through the year, and also to help make this evening's uh, program possible. Someone else who makes this program possible is Margaret Dyser. She's the head of our reference department. She has fostered a relationship with the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh since 2006. And here tonight, as a representative, of the World Affairs Council, who will then introduce our main speaker, this e our moderator this evening, who happens to be a real friend of the Peters Township Library, Dr. Michael Nyberg, which we are thrilled to have him back in town. But Anna Harrison is the Director of Public Programs, so she's going to tell you a little bit more about the program we have this evening, and a little bit more about our friend, Dr. Michael Nyberg. So here's Anna. Chair of War Studies at the United States Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. 
His published work specializes on the First and Second World Wars in global context. The Wall Street Journal named his Dance of the Furies Europe and the Outbreak of World War I, one of the five best books ever written about that war. In October 2016, Oxford University Press published his Path to War, a history of American responses to the Great War in Europe, 1914 to 1917. And in July 2017, he, uh, Oxford published his Concise History of the Treaty of Versailles. In 2007, he was awarded a prestigious medal from La Renaissance Française, an organization founded by French President Raymond Poincaré in 1915 to keep French culture alive during the First World War. So we're very pleased to have Dr. Nyberg here again, and without further ado, I'll pass the mic to him. Thanks to Margaret and Myra for all the wonderful hospitality as always here in Peters Township and thanks to Anna and the World Affairs Council. I'm going to introduce the four speakers in turn, even though I think Myra ran away with my bio sheet on these guys, but that's okay. It's a little green piece. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the Army War College, thank you. It's an 11 month uh, program. Uh, the students are awarded a master's degree, as you can see from the gentleman in front of me, they are senior officers in the United States military. We also have 78 international officers, of which we have one representative whom I'll introduce in just a bit. They will go on from the Army War College to senior ranks and senior important positions in their respective forces, the Army, Air Force, or their own uh, force. They are here today to give talks on their areas of specialization for about eight to 10 minutes. I'll introduce all four, then they'll each give their talks in turn, starting at my far left and coming forward. Uh, and then happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, my boss is happy if I tell all of you that everything you hear these gentlemen say tonight is their own personal opinion. It does not represent the opinions or policies of the United States government or any agency or individual therein. So this allows them to speak freely. I see the lawyers in the room smiling. So this allows them to speak freely. Uh, they are not here to be put on Twitter as a senior government official tonight said. These are just their personal opinions. So with that, let me start at the far left uh, with the United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Steve Tofty, an Air Force aviator who has accumulated a wide range of command control and air battle management experience in a 22 year Air Force career. Uh, he has flown 2,400 flight hours as a weapons controller and crew commander. That's a lot of hours in the air. Uh, while aboard the E-8 Joint Stars and E-3 AWACS aircraft, he also had a very challenging assignment that I'll talk a bit about tonight as a NATO staff officer in Belgium, where he was responsible for the development and coordination of NATO military policy and doctrine. Uh, down to his right, Lieutenant Colonel Shaw Pick is a native of Kirkland, Washington. He is a U.S. Army signal officer, which means he's responsible for cyber and all the very fancy and sophisticated communications that usually work just fine at the Army War College. When they don't, I don't blame him. Uh, he has airborne qualifications and special operations assignments in his background, which have taken him around the world, including multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. He worked in NATO's strategic plans for NATO training uh, and also is a graduate of the prestigious United States Army School of Advanced Military Studies at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and along with his brother, may be the only two speakers in the United States Army who fluently speak Assyrian. To his right is the one problem guy of the group because he was born and raised in Baltimore and claims still to be a Ravens fan, though I've been working on him. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Eric McCoy, we are working on him, I promise. He's an Army logistics officer who has deployed to Afghanistan as a battalion executive officer. What that basically means is when there's a problem at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's his telephone that rings, not the commander's. The following year, he was a utilization tour as an action officer in a maintenance division on the Joint Staff's Logistics Directorate, followed by an assignment to the Army staff. Uh, this summer, he is expecting, at least as of last uh, call, to be going back to Afghanistan this summer. And to my immediate left, to his right, it's my pleasure to introduce from the Nigerian Army, Colonel Abdullah Haruna Ibrahim, a military police officer and a graduate in the Department of History from the Nigerian Defense Academy. Colonel Ibrahim has a master's in law enforcement and criminal justice and a master's degree in international affairs and diplomacy. He has 26 years of military service and has served in various capacities in his army. His last appointment was as military assistant to the Nigerian Army's Chief of Staff, and I'm proud to say that every year we have 70 to 80 international officers from around the world. He is the very first international fellow to be a member of an Eisenhower, Eisenhower Speaker Series 
like this one. So you're in for a real treat. I'm going to turn it over to Steve. They'll give their four remarks in order, and then I'll moderate the Q&A. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, like Mike said, my name is uh, Steve Toffey, and uh, before I begin my prepared remarks, I would just like to say uh, on behalf of my uh, friends and colleagues, uh, thank you to uh, the Peters Township Public Library. More importantly, thank you uh, to, to everybody here in the audience for coming out on Valentine's Day uh, to listen to four military officers uh, talk about some things that have been going on in our lives and uh, in, uh, in our careers. So uh, where I want to go tonight uh, is kind of briefly uh, talk about some of the experiences that I had, some of the lessons I've learned, and a recent assignment I had uh, at NATO, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So uh, just to kind of start it off, um, far be for me, uh, you know, a simple Air Force a Lieutenant Colonel to contradict one of history's greatest wartime leaders, uh, but I'm going to do that. Um, Sir Winston Churchill, uh, argue, arguably the most dominant political figure of the World War II alliance uh, that defeated those fascist Axis powers, uh, had famously been quoted as saying, there's only one thing worse than fighting with allies, and that's fighting without them. Uh, and I'm going to tell you that after spending an assignment at NATO, uh, I think that uh, Britain's famed Prime Minister is steeped in Allied operations as uh, he had been during his lifetime, was, was kind of off the mark and, and incorrect. Uh, I don't believe that his edict that the only thing worse than fighting with Allies is fighting without them. Uh, what I truly think and what I adamantly believe is that the only thing worse than fighting with Allies or fighting without Allies is trying to negotiate with them, trying to come to reason with friends is very, very difficult. Uh, finding mutual agreement among our nation's closest democratic friends, again, is far tougher than I'm ever deploying with them, and is, for me, is much harder than ever flying combat missions with them. I'm trying to find that common ground on NATO policy and doctrine among 29 separate transatlantic allies was especially frustrating because despite working side by side with a number of our friends and allies throughout my career, I was still an extreme novice at building multi multicultural consensus and agreement. And in today's interdependent world, where multinational partnerships are more critical than ever in strengthening and securing our shared interests as well as peace, knowing how to negotiate is vitally important for those of us who may find ourselves having in our hands the mix of international military, economic, and security policy development. Now, as an acknowledgment to the obvious, International organizations, no matter the purpose they serve, are different than U.S.-based institutions. Yes, there are different languages and cultures that pose frequent and unforeseen challenges to direct and efficient communication. There are different legal, ethical, and moral judgments that can stop any project you're working on dead in its tracks. And there are different national politics that can spoil proposed policies and activities, sending those of us who've been working long and hard back to the drawing board. These differences permit numerous delicate and tricky problem sets that can easily pull Americans unschooled in multinational maneuvering into unfamiliar and more importantly uncomfortable intellectual territory. However, I honestly believe that learning, understanding, and employing principles behind negotiation, specifically engaging in strategic empathy, being able to separate the problem from the actual people, understanding our common interests when we engage in dialogue and discussion, as well as trying to forge alternative approaches to the, uh, the problems and develop ideas, we can cultivate the cognitive dexterity that we need to deal with a multitude of different thoughts, opinions, and attitudes that engulf multinational staff officers on a daily basis. And again, in another nod to the obvious, alliances and coalitions are quite adept at creating friction. Despite their dogged determination for common purpose, tension is inevitable and extremely common. Nations rarely come to the table with identical objectives. And those of us that are working these policies and this doctrine often find ourselves trying to fuse together different approaches in an attempt to alleviate the political and ideological, ideological concern that gets presented. And it also is not out of the realm of possibility to suddenly be thrust into the role of referee, where I would have to adjudicate socially disagreement or stately dissent on a number of issues with colleagues and coworkers. And again, how I know this? Because it happened directly to me. While I was at NATO, I was asked to incorporate advanced technologies and utilize some quote-unquote out-of-the-box thinking 
into a new air operation concept that I was working for the Alliance. Now trust me when I tell you, my approach did not sit well. NATO's senior air commander deemed my ideas a bit too radical, while a handful of national representatives looked at me and thought I was not being radical enough. So over the course of the year, each time I presented an update, I found myself steeped in negotiation. I was negotiating those changes that needed to be had to balance military necessity with those national interests. I was also negotiating compromise and building consensus to gain approval for the project. And it wasn't easy for me because I had never been formally trained in international negotiation. This complex arena threw me directly from the frying pan into the fire. I was forced to exercise extreme patience in ways I had never had to do professionally in my 22 year military career. I struggled to put personal frustrations aside so I could build the necessary trust and rapport with the very people who seemed to take great pleasure in derailing every effort I was trying to accomplish. And although it took longer than I hoped, I did eventually develop a new kind of intellectual dexterity and reasoning that quite frankly surprised my wife. <laughs> And that's the truth. <laughs> In other words, what, what happened is I learned how to negotiate, although I really did it the hard way. So where do we need to go from here? Well, my recommendation is that this trial by fire approach is something that we should no longer take. And the good news is, is that this method is not being espoused by our senior service leaders. The importance of negotiation as a critical skill has resonated throughout the military, and negotiation education is becoming more and more available. In fact, a former four-star General Chief of Staff, General Martin Dempsey wrote, quote, operating in a multinational environment means leaders will often be in a position where they must lead through influence and persuasion. This fact makes the art of negotiation critically important for all. Additionally, the Secretary of the Air Force officially made negotiation and conflict resolution an individual and enterprise-wide capability, going so far as standing up what we, would be, what we would call a center of excellence dedicated exclusively to teaching negotiation skills. Furthermore, both services have labeled negotiation as a critical leadership skill for both service doctrine and policy. So as America becomes more reliant upon our network of international partnerships, our nation will look harder to its core to those multinational professionals to forge political, economic, and military compromise and agreement. To do so requires a cadre of capable and skilled staffers steeped in the art of negotiation across the entire spectrum of multinational organizations and institutions. Negotiation is the cornerstone, I believe, of effective strategic compromise and problem solving. And I would argue the most important skill one could possess to help you build and maintain peace, security, and prosperity. So thank you very much again for coming out tonight. And thank you for allowing me to uh, share some thoughts with you. And uh, I'm looking forward to the dialogue and discussion that we're going to have this evening. Thank you. Good evening. Again, thanks for coming out. Uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about information and the power of information. So I've been to a few battlefields in my life, and I know what they look like. I'm not here to tell you about the dusty fields of Iraq or the mountains of Afghanistan. I'm here to talk about another battlefield, a new one. And why is this battlefield important to me? Because my wife and children and family live on it every day. And that battlefield is the internet and social media. The battles playing out here are not about military victories. The object of these battles is nothing short of our minds. So today I'm gonna to highlight two sides of this struggle and hopefully close with what might be a way ahead. The first side of the struggle is the power of the crowd. Humans can now connect, coalesce around ideas, organize and act at a speed and scale never before seen. The second side of the struggle is the power of oppression. Governments that choose to can use these same tools to suppress, subvert, and control their populations. The same digital public squares and social groups used by the crowd have become targets of information warfare aimed at your very understanding of reality. Now lastly, I'm going to offer that there is hope for humanity, but that government, certainly not the military, should be the one to fix this. Now clearly in the past 20 years we have learned to live through this information revolution. 
But it's also led to a, a new way for human beings to organize and communicate and even revolt. I call it the democratization of information, knowledge, influence, and power. This has had both positive and negative effects. Individuals and groups are now capable of doing things that only national level intelligence agencies were capable of doing just a few years ago. I'll give you an example. 2014, a self-organized collective of online investigators provided enough internet-based evidence to prove that a Russian military launcher from a Russian military unit in eastern Ukraine had shot down a Boeing airliner, killing all 298 on board. They even identified through social media posts the particular unit and the crew members of that launcher. The power of the crowd can also be a tool of revolution. Using the virality of social media, these disparate groups are now coalescing online and mobilizing against oppressive regimes, resulting in phenomena such as the color revolutions in Europe, the Arab Spring, and the Green Movement in Iran. But as in most struggles, the tide can turn. Oppressors have begun to worry. The list of their auto autocratic counterparts, overthrown by protests in Serbia, Georgia, Ukraine, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, does not escape them. <clears throat> Faced with Syrian rebels or rapidly self-organizing and mobilizing youth movements, autocratic regime leaders see the threat to their power in this no new social media environment, and they are active. Governments can now employ their own tactics to close off their populations from the world. Whether cutting off or degrading internet connections, employing robust state media outlets, spewing internal propaganda and disinformation, or by using government spies posing as activists and dissidents to infiltrate these networks. The fight for the freedom to digitally assemble is joint. Repressive regimes and violent extremist groups having perfected this internal battle to control their population. Some have chosen to turn these tools outward, and the battle for perception is expanding globally and in real time. With the extreme velocity at which these messages travel, the pre-existing echo chambers that more and more of us put ourselves into, conditions are ripe for ignition with the insertion of just the right divisive message. Consider this, one Russian information channel alone has a $400 million budget, broadcasts in six languages, and has more YouTube subscribers than BBC and Fox News. The scale and reach of these weapons platforms is exceptional. Russian web brigades run by Russian youth pretending to be Americans ran a single Twitter account with 136,000 followers, more than the real Tennessee political party they were pretending to be. And their tweets were retweeted 1.2 million times. That same unit ran an account posing as a Black Lives Matter activist and its posts were shared 103 million times before it was flagged and shut down. Now though these play out online, the potential real world impacts of these subversion campaigns can be tragic. As we all saw in Charlottesville, Virginia, and a Washington DC pizza parlor that was supposed to be fronting as a child sex slave dungeon, some of these people act on these hateful and vitriolic messages spread in these online echo chambers. So what is to be done? Should we let the markets decide? Facebook and Twitter did lose huge amounts of stock value recently due to societal backlash and advertiser concerns about privacy, data collection, and hate speech and content hosted on their platforms. Think about this, the single largest stock price drop for a company in New York Stock Exchange history was Facebook. $160 billion, 13 hours. So that's a, that's a force. Is that enough? Some say that information literacy is a public health issue, and I don't necessarily disagree. But the nation has dealt with public health challenges before. And further, we have faced off with propaganda from other nations before. As we did 45 years ago with the Active Measures Working Group, a public-private partnership of government, educators, media corporations, health professionals, and scientists, <laughs> and others, came together to expose Soviet disinformation efforts throughout the Cold War. But well, whatever the solution is, it needs to be driven by a vibrant debate in society. And it cannot sacrifice the one thing we hold most dear, and that is our open, our open society and the free exchange of ideas. Thank you for your time. I look forward to talking to you.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, again, thank you so much uh, for taking the time out of your business schedules uh, to fellowship and dialogue with us tonight. Uh, so as we find ourselves in this in this special place and in terms of one of my passions, we're in a library. And throughout our history, uh, libraries have been incubators uh, for discussion and change as we look at the future. And part of what we study here at the War College is the, the, the science of management and the art of leadership. And as you peel back and you understand leadership, it looks at uh, three components in terms of uh, experience that leaders go through, uh, how they acquire new knowledge, hence being in the library, and how they reflect the process that new knowledge and they translate it into changes uh, and behavior action with regards to these future experiences that we see. And tonight, I would like to spend some time uh, dialoguing with you in terms of a view uh, potentially of the future uh, with regard to leadership, uh, not only in terms of environment, uh, but of key uh, knowledge, skills, and attributes that we feel uh, future leaders should have. And why that becomes so important uh, for those of us in the audience and, and people that we care about, uh, at the War College we discuss uh, leadership at the strategic level. And as we talk about leadership at the strategic level, we're really focused on uh, leaders that run organizations with impact on the national or international stage. And today in the environments that uh, my colleagues have just talked to you about tonight, uh, the barrier for entry is much more coarse. And you can have exposure and run organizations with impact at the international level, whether you're a 29-year-old congressman, a 33-year-old CEO of a social media corporation, or a 40 to 60-year-old head of state, where you can potentially run uh, these organizations that have tentacles out everywhere and can potential effects. So uh, to spend time talking about uh, three particular environmental considerations that we have on the horizon, and three skills which I think will be critical in navigating uh, those challenges. So the first one uh, that I'd like to spend time talking with you tonight about is globalization. Uh, so those who've read uh, Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat are, are fairly familiar with this uh, process of interaction among people, uh, companies, and governments of different nations, uh, which is driven by international trade and investment. In the past, we thought about this as Western businesses uh, finding labor and supply markets in the East, going back all the way to the days of the East India Company. Uh, but now we can begin to expect this to flow from east to west uh, as the middle class in Asia exponentially grows and we begin to see that expand elsewhere. Uh, as these new middle classes emerge in more countries, uh, each with their own set of consumer demands, uh, it becomes essential uh, for future businesses to have the flexibility to adjust for accommodating users or consumers and have a globalized perspective, if you will, uh, in terms of that flexibility to take global corporations and be able to focus down at the local level in terms of, of what is needed. Uh, so as such, as influence over the global commons impacts organizational power, uh, leaders of those organizations have to understand how globalization can affect their views of future markets. Uh, related to our first trend of globalization, the second meta trend that we see on the rise is urbanization. Uh, so by 2035, scholars can expect the global population to increase by another 1.8 billion people. <coughs> Uh, with this growth uh, primarily concerned in terms of occurring in the developing world and largely centered in urban areas. Uh, by some estimates, uh, the world's mega regions will account for 66% of the world's economic activity and will be the breeding ground for 85% of all technological and scientific innovation. However, uh, poorly managed cities and urban centers uh, serve as incubators for inequality, crime, pollution, and disease. Therefore, uh, near-term decisions on infrastructure for these developing urban centers uh, will determine their vulnerability to extreme events and create opportunities for both cooperation and competition uh, among business, government, and academia. So as we look at the connectedness of globalization and consolidation from urbanization, we'll see that influence our third better trend, uh, which is climate change. And conflict due to changes in human migration patterns and over scarce resources will be an obstacle that societies and organizations within those societies will have to traverse. Climate change will increasingly amplify ongoing habitat loss, uh, pollution, invasive alien species, and other adverse effects on the environment. Some may wonder why a national security professional would look at climate change as a concern. Climate change has the potential to threaten agricultural output, 
and increased instability in rapidly growing poor countries uh, that may have interests that align with or conflict with what we look at from a U.S. national security perspective. Uh, as such, uh, strategic leaders need to embed environmental awareness into their organizations in order to create cultures that minimize the impact of climate change uh, while benefiting, uh, looking at the benefits of connectedness, urbanization, and globalization to maintain competitive advantage. Transitioning from understanding the future environment, it's valuable to look at leadership competencies that enable success in the future. Uh, while there are innate uh, psychological traits that we look at for, for leaders in terms of a nature perspective, a lot of leadership development can be nurtured. So those knowledge, skills, and attributes that we look at in our classrooms, in our social organizations, in our homes, we can begin to develop uh, those future strategic leaders for our organizations in the future. And the three trends that I would ask you to take a look at or consider in terms of skills are abilities in processing, integrating, and developing the most. So the first meta competency we look at is processing. And as we look at that, the future will belong to organizations that can effectively build the big data that we see on our computers, on the internet, and on our smartphones. Uh, for the last five millennia, information of some sort has driven human behavior. And as technology evolves, every person on the globe will generate petabytes of data each year. And making sense of such data generation will be an immense, time-consuming problem. Uh, as such, leaders will have to be highly numerate and technically agile in order to extract meaning from this data that their organizations and key stakeholders generate and be able to translate it into useful information. As we process large amounts of information, truly skilled leaders have to be adept into the second meta competency of integrating. Uh, so as we look at that, according to Kevin Kelly's The Inevitable, we discuss uh, all new technologies and processes in the future will derive from a combination of those that currently exist. Integration and recombining, or recombining will create a new unlimited number of possible uh, technologies. And as such, a future educated workforce will find it fairly easy to cut and paste information uh, annotate it with their own input, link it to existing information, be able to search through vast libraries of work that you see in your left and your right, browse those subjects quickly, refine material, and ultimately remake ideas. Uh, as people and organizations process and remake this information, uh, they'll have to adjust their corporate practices as required to maintain advantage. Uh, as being emotionally intelligent, cognitively agile, and making connections between silos and stakeholders will be a hallmark of success in the future. Finally, while processing involves turning data into information, integrating services as a bridge between information and people, the third meta competency is about having the right people on your team in terms of developing diverse organizations and being able to distinguish between surface level diversity, such as social categories, and deep level diversity, such as attitudes, <coughs> information, and values. Uh, in studies, participants are able to view surface level diverse groups with a minimum of one or dissimilar individual and two similar individuals as more positive and accepting, fostering more persistent and confident voicing of dissenting perspectives, and displaying greater task engagement than groups that contain all similar individuals. The most resilient societies in the future will those be those that likely unleash and embrace the full potential of all individuals for both surface and deep level diversity. Changing demographics and increasing need for various skills make strategically your attention to the recruiting and retention of diverse human capital imperatively. Independent of what we feel the future holds, leaders must be able to orient as to where their organizations will acquire their leadership. When key stakeholders are called, the leaders' ability to process, integrate, and diversify, and in what situations they can align organizational vision, culture, and resources to win in an increasingly volatile and complex world. Again, thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to our discussion. Good evening once again, and uh, thank you for having us here this evening. I'm going to talk about a very topic that uh, is dear to my heart, which is uh, Boko Haram terrorist group that operated in Nigeria for the past 15 to 18 years. However, I want to crave your indulgence that I take for the benefit of the doubt of those who have not been to Nigeria to align you to what uh, the geographical location is, or for understanding of what my description would be. Otherwise, I'll be talking to myself. Yeah, and uh, I want to say that Nigeria is a country in the continent of Africa where you have 54 countries of different historical uh, background based on the colonization process that took place in Africa. And Nigeria is located in West Africa. It happens to be the largest uh, country in West Africa. 
with a population of an estimated around 190 million people. It's the seventh most populated country in the world. It's rich, blessed with uh, oil and the seventh largest producer of oil in the world. However, it was colonized by the British and it's neighbored by Chad, Cameroon, and Nigeria. It got independent in 1960. It operates a presidential system of government like the US with three tiers of government and was under a prolonged military rule for close to two decades. So that led some foundation of what I'm going to talk about. The terrorist group Boko Haram today is known to be one of the most deadliest terrorist groups in the world based on the atrocities and human rights abuses they've been involved in, in the past 15 years or about. The group came into being sometimes in 2002 by an Islamist scholar called Muhammad Yusuf. Following the long military rule in Nigeria from 1985 to 1999, it was a military administration. So on transition of power in 1999, one of the governors went in a kind of alliance with an Islamic scholar Judging based on his fellowship, I thought was he needed to attract votes, so he went into an alliance with an uh, Islamic scholar and eventually got elected into power and then gave some appointments to members of the sect. However, it became, the relationship became sour within no time and they had issues. He was demanding more than probably what the governor could offer, so at the end, they fell apart. And by 2004, there had started having issues. And by 2009, he was arrested, and because of the gross human rights abuse, unfortunately, he was summarily executed in 2009. Following that, the group breaks and became an armed struggle group. And the history of Nigeria, northern Nigeria, is predominantly Islamic in nature. And this is also due to the fact that earlier, Contact with the northern part of Nigeria was through the Trans Sahara trade routes, ranging from North Africa to West Africa. And through the Islam came, it was a trading route for those who are historians amongst us who will know about the Great Songhai Empire, Mali Empire, and the Kanemborni Empire. So that became a route through which Islam came. Now, these groups knew about the existence of that route, which is between the countries of Chad, Niger, Cameroon and Nigeria. So once they break up, they went into that ungoverned free space, which is approximately about 521 square miles. And it became a safe haven from where they operated upon to evade Nigeria from time to time. And what they did is that if they evade this time and commit atrocities, when the Nigerian armed forces go after them, they cross over to the next border. And since they had relatives across the borderlands where in mere separation by the British, they, they are harbored at each part of the cross-border location they decide to move into. They continued until in 2014, April, when they went to a school and kidnapped 276 secondary school girls in the night where they were sleeping in their bodies. And that became a very dicey situation for the country and the world at large became, there was an outcry where the then President of the United States of America, President Barack Obama and his wife, led a campaign against the group and eventually the uh, legislature, later the U.S. Congress passed a resolution to identify the group as a terrorist organization. And since then the group has been uh, operating. But however, the good news is that Sometimes in 2005, the government that was in power here to this period lost the election because of this effect, because it did little or not much to be able to recover the skills from the hands of these terrorists. However, by 2014 and 15, when the president went for election, he lost the election. And by 2015, he was voted out of power, and the next president who came in, who is currently the next president, who is the sitting president, and due for another election in some few days' time, 
was able to make that a priority since that was the basis by which he was put into power. Following that, therefore, most of the guests were released. As I speak to you now, we have four of them in Carly, in Dickinson College, two in Virginia, also schooling here in the US. The group still exists, but from 2015 to date, they've relatively been uh, suppressed. They had little or no much effect like they used to do. In to this period, they were occupying 17 counties, but now they don't hold any of the counties as the forces have been able to flush them out of the location. However, how did this group come to be so powerful and how were they able to raise funds? They were raising funds through kidnapping, illegal robbery, bombing, suicide bombing, and so on. And I want to categorically emphasize that they were neither a religious group or a religious uh, affiliated organization that they are just purely a criminal organization operating under the name of Islam. And why did I say so? They go to churches, to bomb, as well as mosque. So all their desire is to just cause fear and uh, commit crimes against humanity. They have been involved in a lot of human rights violations. And a few of them have so far repented and the government has been making effort to integrate them into the society. So that's all I have to say about it. Thank you once again for your audit and look forward to a peaceful uh, deliberation. Thank you. So when, 
when a when a when a party's not holding to the contract, you know, what do you do? You you, you try to get them compliant with the contract, and you you, you bring levers of coercion and or influence to, to do that. But when you null and void the contract, you really no longer have a relationship, and I don't know how that leaves you in a better place. So I would offer that as an optic, a little different um, on it, and and it goes for for any any tree uh, or agreement. Um, Second to your, the second part of your question is uh, escalating to de-escalate is, is a dangerous game. Um, and so I'm not sure, you know, I'll, I'll see your intermediate missiles with mine and we'll see where this goes. Um, it's only thing it's worth in the past. Yeah, it, it may be, may be. Um, I just, I, I think that there are, if there are other options on the menu, right, through through the alliance to to increase pressure and, and coercive power uh, other than, you know, reintroducing, you know, nuclear missiles. But I, that's purely my opinion. Maybe that's worked in the past. And maybe, maybe bring some chip will work with, with Brother Vladimir. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And whether we do this through the education process, 
in schools, some other way, I don't know. Uh, but to teaching them to critically think, what that really means, right? Looking in the mirror and questioning your own biases, some that are so deeply ingrained, they're, they're subconscious, right? We red team prof you know, professionally. We go find people who have diametrically opposed views to us and then put them on the opposite side of our plan and they fight us, right? Because it's the only way you can truly confront the ingrained biases. So how do you do that in life, right? You go up, first of all, remember the echo chambers I talked about. Kids aren't the only ones in echo chambers, right? Look at your social media feed. How many radically different views pop up? And how many times do you go unfollow? I don't want to unfriend them because that would be rude, but I'll unfollow them, right? Uh, and so we, 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 we seal ourselves off in these cognitive echo chambers, right? Where we are constantly told what we already believe, and, and we're shocked and amazed when we get, you know, we run up against an alternative viewpoint, and our, and our response is emotion and anger. Uh, so I think starting with the, the younger kids, and helping them develop the critical thinking skills to truly go out into this, whether it's the social media environment or the playground, right? It's the same thing. Who's telling you something? Why are they saying that? Who are they and what's their agenda, right? And is that the only place you're hearing it from? Right, multiple sources, you know, are better than one source. So, you know, it's a fairly non-technical explanation in my, my view for how we get after this and become more socially and informationally literate. Um, and there are societies out there under a, a barrage of information warfare every day, right? Go, go talk to an Estonian. Uh, and that, that, that society has become pretty resilient because they recognize the threat, if that helps. If I can follow up on that, Colonel Mulcahy, you talked about some of the uh, bogus Twitter accounts that do disseminating misinformation. On a percentage basis, what are we talking about? Because I've heard uh, some experts say you know, it could be 50% of some of these political sites are, are, are uh, falsely propagated just to, to, to spin a view. Yeah, so the question is what, uh, approximately what percentage of social media sites Prime are fake? Twitter, right? Primarily Twitter, but others are. Do you have any, I mean, do you have any sense? Uh, short answer is no in the aggregate, but I, I did see in the last two weeks that uh, Facebook and Twitter had both deactivated just based on on one one threat vector had had deactivated thousands of accounts. But think about it: there are over there are billions of people on Facebook. So is that a big number? I, you know. I, I think 50% is probably high, uh, but it's a lot. And and the problem is, is there are professionals behind them, and they're very good, and they're persistent. And we haven't even talked about algorithmic warfare and when, when botnets turn into neural networks and, and artificial intelligence getting behind these, and then it's not even people spewing them, and the, and the velocity and scale really goes scary quick. Um, but again, if, if, we, if we know how to think and how to assess information rather than just ingest it because it looks good, uh, a lot of that becomes less effective, if that makes sense. I'm hopeful. Thank you, Greg. First of all, you're from Pennsylvania. Last year, this time, Boko Haram kidnapped several hundred school girls and returned all of them but one teenager named Leah. Any word on her status? So the question is about the one uh, girl kidnapped by Boko Haram whose yeah. status is still unknown, but maybe yeah. not. Yeah, but what happened was this, uh, and thank you for welcoming me, what happened was this, Leah yeah. was kidnapped along the line with uh, some number of girls. It's rather sad that she's not released until today, and the reason is because uh, they played about her psychology. What did they say to her? Just pronounce that you're Muslim and will release you, and she refused. If I wake up, I'll say I'm a Muslim just for me to get out of my kid. It, it's a simple thing, you see. The, the government tried as much as, not like what we had, because we had the first experience which was very bitter. Uh, I mean, 276 girls kidnapped, and they immediately dispersed these girls. And the size of where they operate is as big as about 1,029 square miles. So if you disperse little kids there on a terrorist, it is very difficult to get them back. And again, it's likely going to be military operations that will lead to bombing and all that. So the tendency of even killing some of them 
in, in a, an attempt to rescue them is also there. So when this girl, the second, when this president came, he's a military retired military officer, and coincidentally, a graduate of uh, US Army War College in the class of 1980. So he's conversant with these issues. Immediately they kidnapped these kids. He went into action. He went there himself, not directly to the terrorists, but to the state. And an immediate effort was made to trace these girls. They got them. And I wouldn't know what exactly went uh, into payment or anything or how they were able to get them back. But she was asked to just pronounce that, okay, I, it's difficult. I wouldn't like to pronounce that I have changed my fate just to be released. But in danger, you can say that. That's exactly what I thought. But unfortunately, she didn't do that. Two days ago, even while here, I had uh, said they were going to execute her, but they've not executed her. She's still alive. But unfortunately, they've not been able to release her. They've been using her to you know, do bargains and all that. But the government is making all efforts it can to get her out. She's alive. You're welcome, sir. Also for Colonel Hill. Yeah. Um, I realize most of the incidents of Boko Haram have taken place within the northeastern area. But did you have any cooperation from the military or police forces with Niger or Chad or Cameroon? Yes. What, you want to repeat the question? Or yeah, no, I guess. Uh, uh, they, we, we have. You know, the extent of why we had failure at the initial stage was that the then president did not. Thought, I mean, and he himself and his uh, team didn't think about a collaborative effort to fight this. And since it's a cross-border issue, you can't go into another country to, you know, do that. So when the current president came into power, he went, he traveled around the four countries and was able to allow the ministers of defense and the chief of arms staffs of the respective four countries to come into an alliance of a joint effort. While we push from our end, they also push from their end. So that's helped greatly in reducing their capacity to operate. And, and, and I must confess to you that is part of the success uh, that led to what we have now, relatively peace. And true, like you said, it operated just within northern part of Nigeria. But it came up to the capital of Nigeria because the UN headquarters was bombed. And then some part of the city, capital city, were bombed. But since 2015 to date, we've not been able to do any of such bombing. to my right because he's just recently completed a research paper into that same topic and I'll dovetail there. <laughs> I have always considered that a challenge that America should look up to. And while I came on the studies, I decided to make that happen. It's either the two species I could talk about, Boko Haram or China in Africa. And it's not just in Africa. Then Latin America, Asian countries as well as Africa. And this Silk Road Initiative, what is it all about? America has ruled the world, and now it has a pair competitor, and that's China. And while attention has been drawn to Russia, China is vast and smartly 
circumventing some of the world order in order to achieve its height without anybody knowing. And it's something that requires serious thought and serious attention. In Africa, most Africans think China has given them roads and facilities, but it's rather a bitter pill uh, coated with sugar, which only time will reveal what the implication is. And militarily, I look at it, it has a, it has a military base in Djibouti. Aside the military base in Djibouti, it's known formally when you control the sea, you control the war. And since America has controlled the sea through your air, uh, aircraft carriers, they decide to go through the land, Silk Road, aside from, you know, exploring raw, raw materials from Latin America, Australia, Asia, and Africa, they are also, you know, depopulating their citizens to some of these places. They have a lot of people, and, and, and the best way to do it is to spread over. And that will become a serious challenge, not only to other parts of the world, but Africa too. In Africa, for instance, they buy the ports, they take the raw materials. If America can complain about the fact that they are not sure whether China is complying to trade agreements, you, I wonder what Africa will say, who doesn't even know what they are ex exploring? Because they, they might come with the name of exploring gold and they may be exploring up to 10 mineral resources without the Africans even knowing. And since they also have the rail lines, that they will take them to the ports which they also have the concession. So it becomes very difficult to say exactly to what extent of manipulation. So I simply see us going back to China colonizing the world. And which is going to be a very dangerous issue. Because if you have all the ports, if there are even if, if it has to have pair competition with America and there's war and it has the ports, how do you even deploy in such countries? Because it's all over, it's going to engulf American forces all over the world because it already has sports and it's beginning to gradually take part in. Uh, formerly they don't used to send their troops outside, but currently in Africa they are Chinese troops. In South Africa recently they opened a Chinese police station. They said they are policing South Africa with South Africans. But I doubt how a sovereign nation will allow another nation to have its police operating alongside that country's police within the country. It clearly shows a form of a new kind of colonialism, and it's dangerous. So that's all I can say to that. So the only thing I could probably add to uh, my esteemed colleague's uh, great observation in terms of his research is, uh, one, potentially looking to the future, uh, how we partner and use uh, economic and diplomatic uh, national power. Uh, some countries that look to uh, China as economic aid, if you look at it in terms of uh, painkillers, vitamins, or drugs is a metaphor. Like, look at it as, hey, this is a painkiller where they eventually become addicted in terms of drugs. Like, hey, these are things that China can do for us economically. And then what they wind up seeing is uh, where it's an influx of people or China uh, taking up uh, real estate or presence uh, in those countries. I think what will be interesting to observe over time is the aging crisis in China. So as uh, their elderly get older and there is a demographic inversion, uh, if you will, in terms of uh, a, uh, I wouldn't say middle class of age, but is uh, is the next generation behind. And as you look at uh, some of the second and third order effects of uh, reproductive rights and, and how uh, China, in terms of aging, uh, will continue to evolve, I think it is around the, the 2030 to 2040 uh, margin with regard to time, uh, as you have. Uh, uh, older citizenry uh, and not necessarily a younger generation to take care of them uh, or provide health care, uh, that, that will be potentially a, a demographic crisis uh, for China in, in terms of trying to go and navigate that. So uh, in the short term, looking at uh, how we can effectively partner and how uh, we can create international coalitions, if you will, uh, to counter uh, China's predatory economics. And, and just to add to it again is that politically, because they uh, smartly you know, provide loans to African countries, bypassing the standards that, that, that have been created by the World Bank and uh, IMF, they have found a smart way because this ones give African and developing countries some conditionalities such as uh, 
the basic value system which America has recorded as tenants for giving out those loans, they bypass that and say, well, we'll give you the loan. You know, we don't, you don't, we don't need whether you are abusing human rights or not. We'll give you what matters is the relationship. Aside that trick used is that when it's time to vote in international forums, these little countries that are entrapped by this little dicey gift that they give them or, or a kind of Shiloh kind of partnership will also be forced to vote alongside China and thereby affecting America's position in the leadership of the world. And I think it's something that's worth looking at. Hopefully there were too many holes in it. <laughs> <laughs> no, there weren't. Uh, 
covered some things that everybody should be aware of. Uh, and with a little bit of research, all of the information you talked about is publicly accessible. So research and critical thinking are great. But as someone who's worked on, I've worked on the military side, I've worked on the federal government side, and I've worked on the commercial side. From a commercial perspective, uh, we fought for years to get leadership buy-in within corporations in the fight against spear fishing campaigns. And it took forever to do it. Now, virtually every successful business out there today has a department that's dedicated to social media. They're advertising on Facebook, they're advertising on LinkedIn, but what I don't see in those departments is someone who provides educational benefits within the organization. Because I can tell you right now, I've got a LinkedIn account and I'm connected to a lot of cyber professionals. And I've been approached by sketchy folks to be my friend, okay? Um, I know not to accept those invitations. How do we get people to pay attention? Because cyber is kind of like a tangible thing. It, it, you can't see it, you can't touch it, you tend to ignore it until TJ Maxx is hacked and your credit card is compromised. Suddenly you have an awareness. How do we get people to the question is how do we raise public awareness yes. to make people better educated to be the first line of defense themselves? Yes. Let me know when you figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, you're right. It, 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 we live this pain. Um, and, 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 it, and it's exacerbated by the, the belief, not the perception, the belief on the part of corporate leadership and government leadership that cybersecurity is a technical problem. Right? It is a, what's the technical solution? How do I program the network? How do I defend the network? When the, when the biggest cybersecurity vulnerability anywhere is sitting in chairs in this room, yeah. right? And the most dangerous part of the weapon is your mouse finger, right? Uh, so it is, it's education and training because we are the ones that click on something or we, we have poor practices and we let it in, right? Most, most high-end cyber attacks that get written about if you really pull it back, have a human doing something at some point before the code does what it does. Um, so I feel your pain. I feel it too. Uh, except I get, I get yelled at a lot more probably than you do. Uh, so it is, but it, it goes back to, right, the, the, the theme in my answer is, is the best defense is, is getting better up here, right? Limiting this uh, and starting to think better about what we're clicking on, who we're talking to, you know, uh, but it's hard. It's hard to just get marked. So, yeah, I, I'm afraid I didn't, we should have put it on the, 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 the program is that I wasn't coming with a solution. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but there's might be information awareness training is probably right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't yeah. push it through eight hours uh, of computer based training. I think we have time for probably two more questions. I'm going to ask you to please be quick. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's very difficult, and uh, I, share, I share your feelings about it, and the truth is this. You have various interests interested in Africa. You have the colonial masters who left, and their interest is still there. They don't want Africans to be uh, united or straight or do things right because they have interest in what the corrupt politicians will always steal from Africa and deposit in Europe or Swiss Bank or Panama, that's one aspect. And you have the second aspect of the elites who took over power from the colonial masters who themselves are corrupt and do not want to see others get money so they 
try to find their uh, power, get into power through whatever means they can to continue the exploitation. Then you have the big corporate organizations who are also investing in Africa, who if Africans get the acts to get it right, you will not have the opportunity to exploit. So you see, these are the problems. But Africans can still find it out and do it. But it has to be the people themselves to realize that this is how they're being exploited. Without that, we will continue to be there. I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Maybe two, if we're really quick. Yes, sir. The times are changing. This time we came to listen to you gentlemen. We didn't hear a thing about troop movements or new weapons, all about social change. It troubles me that the Army knows more about things than anyone else these days. With, 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 the political, with, with the political situation being what it is today, and the unrest of, around the world, and even in our own country, the business, are you guys prepared to take on the classic role of the military in controlling things if necessary? So the question, the question is, as everything else kind of comes apart, <laughs> is the Army still focused on the basic mission sets that it has? And how does the Army feel about moving in to areas it doesn't traditionally belong in? How's that for an easy question? Fun, fun, fun. Come on, I put you up to first go. Yeah, first go, here we go. Um, some of the things that we study in the War College are the, uh, in terms of going back to closets, uh, with regard to uh, the, the nature and character of war. Uh, so the nature are things that have not changed with regard to warfare, and we look at that being uh, complex, we look at it being violent, we look at it being people-centric, uh, where it, it involves humanity. What we see uh, that changes over time is the character of war. So. Uh, environmental considerations, what we see in terms of revolutions in military affairs and technologies. Um, and, and there can be debate in terms of what we determine for force structure and, and movements. Uh, but the, the human nature of it is, is what is enduring. And what we touch in the War College, whether it's uh, understanding how the Defense Department works, looking at theory of war and strategy, uh, looking at uh, national security planning, uh, with such a history, a lot of it is understanding that human dimension, uh, where you see a lot of the things that we talk about in the behavioral sciences in terms of understanding human psychology, understanding sociology, understanding human dynamics, uh, especially for the Army uh, and for a lot of our other military services, I will argue to a degree as well, understanding that human dimension becomes important. Uh, the second part, if I misunderstood your, your statement, sir, I apologize in advance. I, I think part of what we look with concern is that people look at the military as a Swiss Army knife in terms of being able to do all these different things across the spectrum. And our concern from that becomes being able to remain uh, apolitical and being able to be competent in what the nation calls us to do in terms of uh, being able to fight in the nation's wars. Uh, the infrastructure of the military allows them to do a lot of other things in terms of uh, execution of national power. Uh, just because of being able to project military forces anywhere in the world and the, the, the size of the Defense Department allows us to do a lot of things. Just because we have the power to do those things doesn't mean that we necessarily should do those things. And, and that's where events like this become so important in terms of the civil dialogue. Because ultimately, uh, we are subservient and we follow uh, the desires of our American government and the wishes of the American people. And the, the second that we don't do that, when people look like, okay, the military or the adults in the room, uh, that becomes a dangerous assumption. And it oftentimes goes to hero worship, and oftentimes it goes to where the American public is not critical and ask the tough questions of this military that it should. Uh, so the caveat or challenge I would do to that is that your military can do a lot of things, uh, but it's empowered, it gets its energy, it gets its strength, it gets its resolve, it gets its guidance from an informed American public. I would only add a little bit to it there. So, you let you have the full applause, sorry. <laughs> In the eight, nine years I've been working
working with these military officers, as they see every other institution in America becoming politicized, one thing I've really admired about working with these professionals, they want the United States military to be seen as American, and that the decisions about who will govern the country, who will make the decisions, are vested in elected officials. So that's something I've been really, really proud to be associated with, and that puts the burden back on you. And hearing all the great questions you've asked, I have no doubt that you can do it. So. Thank you to all of you. Myra's going to take the floor. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I just want to. Oops. I want to. Oh, yeah, time. I want to, uh, of course, ask you all to join me in thanking our panel and also Dr. <laughs>